I voice my feelings on the story, writing, humour, and the characters, but now we're at the last few points. Remember, these thoughts are with the best intentions of the show at heart, and you're more than welcome to share your own in the comments down below. For now though, let's talk about the animation that brings this world and its people to life. Come now, children. According to my schedule, we are already three minutes behind. Schedule! Now, even at this point, it would be very hard and honestly rather pointless to compare the animation to other anime-related works since Ruby uses such a unique program. But I can compare it to last volume, and it shouldn't surprise many people to say there are improvements. That would be the case for anything with time and experience, and it's showing now the animators are grasping the style that they want, as well as getting more skilled in using Poser. A lot of the visuals have evolved, and that's really what a lot of Volume 2 was, evolving. And you can see that with the improvements in the show and out of it, like the longer episode runtimes. There's the upgrades in detail for towns, like the holographic tech and the lights and the signs, the path cracks merging better, and of course, the background people no longer be in shadows, which really helps some scenes work and not give the viewer whiplash seeing focused detailed characters in scenes where behind them seems to be the entire population of the Shadow Realm. Take the scene with Roman chatting to the White Fang, the new recruits, and Sun and Blake. This scene couldn't work effectively if Roman was talking to a group of uniformed White Fang members in a huddle of shadow people mixed in with Sun and Blake in disguise. The effect proposed there would have been lost. And while it does give a bit of a sharp contrast now looking back comparing to Volume 1 to this, I do think it's a change that works for the better for the examples just like this. The style of the show does continue with the vibrant, bloom-filled, colourful feel that works for the show, but the backgrounds have been given a bit more of a muted tint approach, and this has allowed the cast and various other items to pop and yet still have the locations not distracting from the events taking place, and even in some cases, help out with the tone as well. This is really clear when it comes to the standout upgrades in the lighting. Lighting isn't as basic as before. It's worked in tandem this time with Poser rather than being added after the fact, and it feels more fitted and blended in better with the shadows and with the characters, so they feel much more like they're really a part of the location they're in and it sometimes helps for some effective added immersion. It's been used wonderfully in two key scenes of note. The Blake and Ospin chat with the overhead light in the darkened room, making for a slightly tense and personal feel to the discussion, and the Blake and Yang chat with the more soothed sunset feel for a settling yet emotional backdrop. Both lighting styles for me really add into the events taking place. There's also better fitted effects mixed in with the poster animated shots, like dust blasts, sparks, and a much better looking runner animation which overall doesn't stand out as much as it did in Volume 1. This heightened boost is also shared in the walk-in and more casual animations, which has more of the mocap work and doesn't feel as restricted, while at the same time you can definitely see some characters having movements and mannerisms that fit to who they are. And in fights, well, it's still some of the show's finest work. The team continued to make some stunning brawls, and done in that high quality that's expected of them and often attributed to the show. Varied too, not just in their themes such as the food fight, the giant mech, and large numbers versus one affairs, but also in how it's directed. And just like with casual movements, Characters in battle still have fitting traits to help them feel more unique and stop many characters feeling the same when in motion. Like Jean's less graceful movements, Yang's very intense rushes mostly with her upper body strength being the focus, or Ren's more refined and sharp animations. Heavy hitters don't look the same as the more nimble and quick lot, and getting bigger focus on their blows more so than the amount of attacks that's flying. None more clearly pointed out than when you compare the styles of Yang and Neo. Again, on the directive side, there were some very well done visual styles which helped the fights feel more special, and not just a basic approach going on. Compare, for instance, the first fight with the Grimm in Mountain Glen to the fight with them in Vale. For the Mountain Glen fight, the cutaways and transitions added more focus on the blows, even letting some focus be on one to one fights 
even amongst a crowd, and topped off with some drawn out lead ups to said strikes, but with the later fight, it's showing off the heavy focus of the larger amount of grim numbers, making sure that there's as many enemies shown as possible, and shots have a wider focus on the grim surrounding the girls initially, to support the odds that's weighed against them. Another good example is picking apart the Mercury and Pyrrha fight, which had a subplot that Mercury was scouting Pyrrha, and with that, the fight was designed with a much more slower pace. The angles making sure each meeting of blows was still exciting, but allowing for zoom-ins for finer emphasis at points, and the directing was sure to target the mindset of both of those guys in battle. Pyrrha, fresh off of clocking Team Cardinal's heads, was taking this one more slowly, scouting out someone who she's never fought before and that she's not very aware of. And of course, Mercury was scouting out Pyrrha for reports to Cinder. There was more emphasis on reactions and more focus given to movements to allow the viewer to follow Mercury as he analyzes each contact and attack. If it was made with the same pace as Pyrrha's earlier fight, which was more of a showcase of contrasting power and skill over Team Cardinal's collective skill, and a spotlight moment on the character herself, then it wouldn't have accompanied this subplot effectively, and while pleasing on the eye, would have had a lesser effect to Mercury's plot point here. That being said, there were still a few visual hiccups that did take some notice. Stuff like clipping can be relatively ignored, especially for the nature of the animation, but there were slip-ups, like Cinder's mask popping on and off, as well as her run-on animation on an angled surface on the roof, looking a bit off. There was also Ren melting into the floor, Ruby and Weiss switching places in the second, and the flickering lights going on behind Glinda, which can be distracting and can pull from the immersion, especially when it's affecting a big scene like Cinder's mask, given that she's trying to obviously hide her identity, and the guards aren't killed, they're just KO'd. The show has these little issues which may not be much to the passing eye, but more noticeable for the keener eyes, and people like me who review and such. It's hard for me to say if it's a fault on the animator, since some of these could easily be a product of the program in use. But at least Cinder's mask aside, a host of the mistakes have been the small variety, and not majorly disastrous. There's just some things that need to be a bit more smoothed out or double checked next time to avoid such inconsistencies or mishaps. On more positive sides, the volume also had some instances of using different animation styles. The series isn't shy of using these different kind of styles for whatever purpose, but here we have the style used in the prologue of the first volume, echoed for the World of Remnant episodes, and a bit of a chalk image in motion style used for Yang's flashback. The more blocky silhouette style used for the World of Remnant episodes works for what the focus needs to be, giving motion and life to the information that's presented through a visual aid. It's not too distracting, and much of the movements keep a steady balance of pace, and with the transitions from one image to another, it's quite effective. Again, it's animation that doesn't have the greatest detail, but when the animation isn't a major focus as it would be within the main content, that's a good thing. The same can be said for the chalk style used for Yang's backstory. First off, it's a style that really fits the tone given. It's rough, but it's also got duller colours, where more richer colours can stand out, which for the most part is the soothed trade colours of Yang and Ruby, a more menacing red, and the white from behind Crow symbolising a comfort and safe feel. The nice mix of grey, whites and blacks also give off a quiet, dead, tense vibe against the more noticeable colours of Yang and Ruby's yellow and red, adding to the risky and haunting setting that Yang is leading them into. Fit in the sense that Yang was making a very bad move right off the start regardless of her good intentions. One response to this scene I heard was feeling disappointed that the movements of the characters weren't more detailed, the scene opting for instead movements with a more sliding approach. Though for me personally, I quite liked it. This bit didn't need to have full animations, and it would have been too much work for really an unnecessary measure. Plus, it gives this scene, along with the style chosen, a more unique feel. Compare it to, say, Chibi Ruby in Volume 1. The motions were more jittery and would blur to them to match Ruby's giddy mood. 
If backstories or flashback portions continue to have differing styles to the show like this one, I very much welcome that approach. It gives the team something new to try on each one, beyond using the 3D models, and it could allow them to have characters in unique and different looks, like Yang and Ruby as kids, saving the team from using full 3D models to accommodate the scene, and only making them for just that. And mentioning Ruby's more chipper animations, when she went chippy last volume, there were also some more anime-esque animations to boot as well, and a personal favourite, Ruby noticing that she's at an angle, and said realisation sends her crashing down to the floor. It's nice little touches that lends to the anime inspirations, and mixes in well with the more western style animations going on. In the end, while it's still packing some technical goofs, and you can tell the team are still getting skilled with Poser and the other programs over time, the improvements in the animation outweigh a lot of the negatives for me, and it's aided in the unique style the show has with some rather effective directing and use of different styles, and be it casual, combat, foreground or background, I definitely feel the animation and design side of things in terms of Ruby definitely deserves praise. It does miss out on anything higher than a 4 because of those said hiccups, but it's no discredit to the positives at all. Again, I'll give these guys for the animation 4 out of 5 stars. Ahem. Sisters! Friends! Wives! Let's focus on the voice acting side of the audio first off. Of course, a vast majority of the cast features either Rooster Teeth faces, and those who have previously worked on Red vs Blue, or the occasional outside talent. And just like in terms of the animation, a lot of them, especially the main quattro, have really grown with familiarity. For the VAs who have worked in acting in other works outside of Rooster Teeth like Grey Haddock, Shannon McCormick and Joel Heyman, they bring in the quality expected, and remain some of the strongest performers. Same as well for the returning guests of Jennifer Taylor, narrating for the World of Remnant specials. Those familiar to voice acting through roles they've had in Red vs Blue, small or big, like Miles, Kathleen and Jen, to name a few, hold up strong. The Ruby Girls voice actresses especially hit great work in this volume, though firstly, I gotta personally say, major props to Barbara Dunkelman. She said herself that Yang is a character that's very similar to her, and that was the approach that she had in terms of voicing her. But this volume, she had a big emotional moment to deal with, and had to carry a variety of emotions, and it never felt forced to me the performance that she gave, and was one of the several who had to explore new tones with her character, and came up golden. Of course, it wasn't just the familiar cast returning and building on their good to strong performances this volume, a new volume meant new faces, and with it, new voices, and none of them felt, for me, awkward or ill-fitting. Kerry as Neptune, I'll admit, being very surprised with by how well he worked his varying emotions. I instantly bought off his cool guy persona with only a few lines of his debut, and he did some top stuff with the rest that he was dealt with, even the goofier to more serious moments, and despite my feelings on the character's actual actions this volume, I do feel confident that he'll be portrayed fine still by Kerry moving on. Both JJ Castillo and Katie Newvile were equally pleasing this volume as the troublesome pair of Mercury and Emerald, and they rocked the volume opening scene with Tuxen quickly selling the two's varying personalities, and the tense tone of the scene with the former White Fang member, who he himself was performed very well by Carding's voice actor Adam Ellis. I was also pleased with another new face, being the guest Jessica Nigri as Cinder, though as said before, I would like to see her have more to chew on, besides the alluring tone and the seductive forceful one, but for what she had to do, I was glad to come out of it happy. On a side note, I also got to give some much needed praise to William Orendorf, who many might not know is the vocal effects for many of the Grimm. Some top stuff there that does need some applause. Same can be said for another of the new voices, Jason Rose, as General Ironwood, gifting us with a perfectly fitting voice for the character, both authoritative and yet still has that strong tone even the more casual or friendly chatter. Looking forward, I can't wait to hear the voices for the likes of the remaining T-1000 
Team Coffee members, as well as Scarlet, Sage and Neo. And all in all, the voice work has been quite pleasing. Even the background voices and one notes have been very effective, even if probably not as strong as the main ones. But I can't say anyone really had a poor vocal performance that would warrant focus. The same praise can be said for the music, which is probably the easiest part of the review to talk about. Good God almighty, it's fantastic stuff. Now, I'm not the most musically insightful, so you won't get deep, knowledgeable insight of the soundtrack out of me, besides the thoughts of a casual music lover. But that being said, Jeff Williams and co repeated their exploits of Volume 1 with hitting another home run. For starters, in terms of the score for the episodes, nothing felt poorly fitted or crafted. Jeff Williams, Steve Goldsheen, and Alex Abraham were able to form truly effective quality content for the background pieces. They did a full gambit of tones and struck gold, even including some wonderful remixes of the character tracks from Ruby Girls, both as action pieces and dramatical ones too, and doing so with some nice flow in between each piece as well. The right pace, the right pitch, the right genre, it all fitted wonderfully. And while some of it will stand out at times from the visuals like in the combat, it's great work that backed up the events on screen and no score piece felt the same. They truly got the right eye for the backing track for the right scene. I especially love all the little motifs for certain characters. Like have you noticed there's a slight magical sounding trade for some of the background tracks going behind Glinda events? Even if some of the tracks have a similar theming to it, there's enough uniqueness to the track to help them feel different. And that's remarkable when you think that they've done everything from the opening theme, the backing tracks for the episodes, vocal tracks, and even backing pieces for the World of Remnant episodes, all while going through a host of emotions and genres. If you want to hear some wonderful work that's stellar on its own, or with the visuals it's melded into brilliantly, check out the score. Of course, we can't talk about the soundtrack without talking about the vocal tracks. Going through them as listed on the CD, and while Volume 1's opening was fantastic in its own right, Time to Say Goodbye is an even more thrilling opening theme for me. The lively pace is so infectious, and yet with that intense feel from the guitars and Casey's vocals that breathes life into the impending danger looming on the horizon, and the start of our heroes getting knee deep into a fight that they may not be prepared for. Also, man alive, it's hard to not air drum along with the wild drumming that's going on. For the fight with Team Ruby vs Roman's mech, we got the song, Die, which has a lovely combination of its fast paced drums, guitar, and blood pumping vocals that worked great as the crescendo of the fight, and felt right at home with Yang's recovery blitz after getting struck down. For the setting switch up of the battlefield to the dance floor next is Shine which fits the bill for Pyrrha and the impact that John's had on her and her possible feelings for him, and worked into a lovely little pop dance club love song with the effects on the vocals and overall chip of feel. Great for the character, the setting, and was crafted nicely into even making a good dance track for Team Juniper, though it's not the only track that's based on Pyrrha and John. Dream Come True definitely comes off as an inner monologue from Pyrrha about John's continued attempts to win over Weiss and how it's affecting her. I like that the vocal tracks aren't just limited to battle themes, and this one is just hard not to sway and smile to, and it's got that nice little bounce to it, added by lovely vocals from Casey and the backing singers. Oh, and if dreams come true will get you swaying, caffeine will get you headbanging and pulling out the air guitar. For me, my personal favourite battle theme this volume, and an excellent track to welcome in Team Coffee to the stage in a big way, as well as a sign that the tides of the fight inside of Vale is swinging in the favour of the good guys. Jeff and Casey both go full blown powerful on the vocals, and the guitar is wildly energetic. The track is made to sound epic, with its speed and the hits of every instrument, and it does so in spades fitting the demolition at hand. Plus, it welcomed back in the full version Lamar Hall, who did vocals previously for I Burn and other Roofs to Teeth related soundtracks. Again, it's my favourite battle theme of the volume, a kick ass rock song with a name that fits like a charm. There is a reason why it's my alarm clock tune. Next up, though, is a big change of pace All Our Days. 
going from caffeine's motorway car chase speed to a more calmer serenade, which feels like the thoughts of Yang watching Ruby grow and her continued wish to protect her whilst being proud of her success. Though of course, I could be wrong. The pace is soft and soothing, so you can really digest the emotion and the lyrics, with a nice steady piano accompaniment flowing with the vocals, and it even does the trick as an instrumental piece and working as the last body blow to a crestfallen Jean's feelings for Weiss. It's a lovely ballad and a prime example of the beautiful vocals of Casey and the music team's skill when working on something that's not for combat. The CD had a nice little treat moving on now in the form of the track simply known as Boop. And by God, is it bubbly. Okay, it starts off nice and slow, but then boom, instant pace change, and we're off with what is no question Miss Nora Valkyrie singing a love song that fits right to her nature. It's so cute, and it's so lively, and even more bouncy than Shine. It really is if Nora took the mic and felt like singing a love song. And I love it. If Caffeine is my favorite battle theme of this volume, then this is my favorite non-battle theme, as well as one of my favorite performances of Casey, and proof again that the music team can do some amazing stuff in a variety of ways. Now we just got ourselves a jazzy love song. The final track and volume tune's ending credits theme was Sacrifice. I believe when asked about it on After Buzz TV at one point, Sacrifice was teased as the song that the Williams pair was most excited about, and it's easy to see why. The other tracks have varied from giddy and happy, fired up and heartfelt. This one, chilling as heck. Even when it picks up the pace at points, this track has such an eerie feel to it. Aggressive too, and a chilling track with ill intent behind it, which works for the feed off from the events of the volume finale and anchor until the show returns with even more badness on the way. A trademark stamp to end the volume on. The soundtrack CD in itself also had some extra treats in terms of an acoustic version of the volume one opener, This Will Be The Day, and remixes of both shows opening themes. In the end, the voice acting, the soundtrack, both combined into some simply brilliant work. The acting has continued to grow and the music continues to be some of Ruby's highlights. I am really cutting a knife on giving it anything higher than a 4.5, simply because I need to hear more of the new voices to truly judge them, but that's not me slamming the voice acting's positives at all, nor is it harming the praise of the soundtrack. A very, very short, from gold, 4.5 out of 5 stars. So now at last, we have my closing overall opinions of Volume 2. After all I've said, do I think Volume 2 was good? Did it improve on Volume 1? Is it better or worse than Volume 1? Well, if it's not clear by now, I don't think Volume 2 was a perfect volume. As mentioned, it weighs heavily on being the middle ground between the intro to the cast, the world, and the plot points that's coming on, and the true coming to blows of the heroes against the villains. The previously referred to status quo didn't shake up as much as you might expect of a volume, but there were developments and new experiences, new sides of the cast that we saw, and a world continuing to expand and slowly evolve, and bringing more people to enjoy and to care about, with the threat looming in closer. I do think the pace was an issue, but I think they stopped this volume at the right point, just maybe needing an episode more to truly utilize its heavy and impactful final set piece at least. The characters continued to show more and experience more, but there was always a sense as big as some of these moments were, we know something bigger is on the horizon, and the writing as a whole was bumpy and probably the weakest point of the volume, even with its own strong positives. That being said, I still found myself thoroughly enjoying what I was watching, and if Volume 1 was the experience of watching something new from Rooster Teeth, something new in terms of Western animated works, and slowly getting interested in what's going to happen, this was the volume that solidified my interest long term, and I'm signed up for more. I want to see what's next, and even if not much changed overall, in terms of the main plots and some faces, I felt it had enough 
to still drive my interest for more, and it's made my wait for Volume 3 a hard one. The improvements are there. Whether it's the animation side of things, the growth in the performances, the world building evolving, the humour, even the rise of some of the positives in the writing, it's enough for me to feel that my time isn't wasted watching and being a fan of the show. And laying my cards on the table, I think it did enough to sneak above Volume 1 as the better volume, so far. I say so far because I have plenty of faith, even with the unfortunate passing of Monty, that the show can continue to grow and develop, and events to come will add on to the enjoyments of the action and the humour, the fondness for the cast and the presentation and my intrigue in seeing what's next gonna bring. I definitely feel there is more to this show than just the insane fight scenes and weaponry or the fact that it's something new in terms of the Western anime S products. Ruby is something I very much enjoy, and I really do hope that it, it continues to improve, regardless of any slip-ups, weak points, or hurdles. Volume 2 was a blast to watch, and I can't wait to see what's next in the world of Remnant. Thank you for watching and being patient with me trying to get this out, it's been a challenge of its own, but I'm glad it's done. And with Ruby Volume 3 on the horizon, it's time to work on some other projects until then, and I'm looking forward to more from Ruby and whatever may come in the future. I hope you enjoyed my rambling retrospective and review of Ruby Volume 2, and if you have your own thoughts on the volume, the show as a whole, or my opinions, do share them down below. And I'll see you next time, until then though,